morning. Morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Mill City Presbyterian Church. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Pastor Ted Buck back to our pulpit. And uh, Ted and I worked together when I first got here, and he was a joy to serve with. But we are, I have to say in all honesty, we are disappointed that Katie is not here. Um, it, really, it's hard to believe, but given the choice between babysitting her grandchild and coming and being with us, oh well, I guess maybe it's not so hard to believe. But we miss Katie and uh, wish that she was with us. Uh, Pastor Ted will be preaching from Jeremiah chapter one, verses 4 through 10, if you would like to follow along in your Bibles. And if you are watching from home, of course, you can always download the, the bulletin from our Facebook site. Um, we are having a congregational meeting today, immediately following the service. And uh, after that, we will have a coffee hour, and you're invited to stay for both. Um, and my other announcement is a reminder that our session meeting is tomorrow night at 6.30 in the office. Um, so how about you folks? Do you have any announcements? Oh, there's got to be one. Alice. I agree with you on that for a minute. Last week we talked to you about what we're going to do is try to gather money for um, a well. And I want to read to you what some people, some of the women from the country of, well, I don't know if it's a country or not, Villa Nueva community. This is their line, probably not in English. A 15 gallon cement tank container for the water well will be built and connections made from the tank on several supply routes, providing each house with a spade. There are 52 houses and a school, 300 people in the community. The pump is needed so that each house has access to clean water for human consumption. The 300 people organized themselves into a women's committee. That purpose is to improve conditions in the community. This women's community made the proposal, and it was approved by the Congress, which is another name for the community board or something, who gave their full support to the project. In other words, we can supply the money to purchase the materials, and by some miracle, probably called hard work, the water well will be installed. So the mission committee will accept your gift with thanks. And hopefully, you put it in a separate envelope or write it on your check that is for the water well. And we do thank you for your contributions. Thank you, Alice. Just imagine how that changes people's lives. To have waters, you know, sometimes I really I feel so guilty because maybe part of that's being a Presbyterian. But I feel so guilty when I think of how freely I use water and how I don't always um, save the water that's perfectly good that I can take outside and use on my plants. And then I think of the water that I waste each day could take care of probably two families easily. So Alice, thank you for bringing this to our attention and giving us all an opportunity to give towards such a worthy project. That mission committee, they're good folks. Let's begin with an opening prayer. Lord, open our hearts to the ways in which you offer us your love and your presence. Help us to see and believe in the wondrous ways that you work in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now our prelude.
join me in the call to worship if you find it in your book. How can we keep still this day? There is joy in this place. God's steadfast love extends to everyone. God, God reaches out to us in compassion. Thanks to God for all the blessings we have received. Let us celebrate God's joyful love for us. Amen. Thank you, Dan. It is at this time that we still join our celebrations in our service. And what would you like to celebrate or ask for prayers for today? Sandy. Um, a celebration. Um, uh, women I worked with when I was in Germany working for the Army way back when, we're, we're still in touch. And we've been Zooming the last couple of years, so we're, I'm having a Zoom this afternoon <laughs> with them, which is always great. And um, then the other thing is I'm having my quarterly CAT scan on Wednesday, so hoping for good results. Absolutely, and we will pray for that. Uh, are there other? Yes, Suzanne. Uh, many thanks for the prayers. I uh, am much happier here sitting in a chair in the church instead of sitting on my bedroom floor wondering how I was going to get up. And again, thanks to Leland and the crew because they managed to get me up without too much problem and nothing was broken, but boy, am I bruised. <laughs> well, it was a good outcome, all things considered, and uh, we've kept you in our prayers. Thank you so much. We'll continue. Johnny. Um, several from Peg. Peg is having some cancer removed off of her cheek on Tuesday. Um, Steve is not doing real well, so please consider a lot of prayers because she's thinking of going back sooner than later because she's going to go in April or May. And also, she has a consult, I think, in the next week for a knee replacement. So keep Peg and her family in your prayers. So prayers for Peg um, with some cancer, is it like skin cancer, mm -hmm. that she'll be um, having examined and it sounds like they're taking it off. They're taking it off on Tuesday. And uh, prayers for her son, Steve. We've kept him in our prayers each week, um, but let's continue um, and keep him on your list. And then uh, Peg's looking at knee replacement, which is always you know, a considerable process. So. She has a lot going on in her life, so let's just keep Peg in our prayers. Are there others this morning? Uh, let me throw in a few extras. Uh, prayers for all the people who are suffering from COVID and prayers for their caretakers as well. There are still a fair amount of, of uh, cases. Um, prayers for Joyce Ranke as she has hip replacement surgery this Tuesday. Um, we pray for those who are in need of shelter as we return to freezing temperatures this week. And uh, a happy birthday to Larry Bender. This coming Wednesday, tell him that we are wishing him a happy birthday. And a uh, happy anniversary on the same day to Rich and Diane. And uh, you know, I was I was trying to guess what what is it? 25, 30 May? years? Over the <laughs> So it appears as though it's been seems longer for Diane. <laughs> And uh, we remember the people of Ukraine. We pray for a peaceful solution, and uh, rather than the armed conflict that it appears to be moving towards. So let's keep that entire situation in the area of Ukraine in our prayers. Um, 
Any late breaking ones? Tobin, delightful to have you with us. Thank you so much. And the little person with you as well. <laughs> the little person is named Savannah. 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 That is lovely. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with it. I just thought it should be acknowledged. Well, thanks for sharing. And, and how old is she? 21 months. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, there will be time afterwards for you all to go and talk. Who's <laughs> that? Uh, let's take a moment for silent prayer and lift to God those cares, those concerns that have gone unvoiced. So let us pray. God, we join you in your ongoing transformation of the world. Where there are drumbeats of war, may we sound harmonies of peace and hope. Peace that is deep and true and just. Peace that blends our voices into a chorus of hope. Hope that inspires and transforms even the most desperate of situations and circumstances. Be with this congregation, O oh God. Continue to blend our voices and weave our lives together in ways that are faithful, profound, and holy. May all we say and do as disciples of Jesus Christ be an offering of praise and thanksgiving for your love. You have heard all our prayers. You know our needs and concerns before our voices can raise them. Help us accept the love you give to us. Empower us to use that love for good in your world. Let your message of hope and compassion go forth from us to your people. We pray for our shut-ins, those who are ill, and pray that they might be strengthened and healed by your presence. We pray for all those who are facing medical treatment in the coming week. We pray that all goes well and that it is successful. We pray for those who are hungry, those in need of shelter, and those seeking employment. We raise up our prayers for Sandy, Robin, Terry, Lance, Steve, Larry, Kylie, Scott, David, Joyce, and Peg, as we pray for their healing and well-being. And finally, dear God, we lift up our troops serving around the world. We pray for their safety, and we remember their families who eagerly await their return. Hear us now as we join our voices in the prayer that Christ taught us when he walked among us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us bring our gifts to God. <clears throat>
Lord, you give us so much. You give us life itself. You give us each other, and you give us your son. And uh, please accept uh, these tokens of our appreciation, our love for you, and, and bless this uh, to, the, to the, the goodwill and the, the good works of, of your church. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, our song of prayer is come thou font number 11 you may be seated Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oops. I'll get this. One of my favorite hymns we just sang, Come Thou Fount. And I appreciate, especially the final verse, to grace our great debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter of chains, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. One recognizing our weaknesses and our great need of God's grace in our lives. It's a wonderful, wonderful hymn. Again, good morning from Vancouver. The travel, the travel over here was, was uh, not clear, but it was dry and uh, very smooth to take. Katie, I think at this moment, is somewhere on the Blue Mountains, traveling to Tri-Cities from Boise to try to have lunch with one of our daughters before heading all the way home. She is a busy ambassador to the family as um, our third daughter is a coach at Boise State, uh, beach volleyball, and their season just started. And she just was asked a couple of days ago to go to Boise and watch Hallie, our, our grandchild, granddaughter. Um, then she was asked while she was there, could she go to Arizona next week for a whole week of watching Hallie. Uh, her, uh, Allison's husband just got switched from girls soccer to head trainer for the Boise State football team. That changed everything, and he was going to be watching Allie. So uh, 
Jade's all over that, you know. And we'll just see if she comes home a couple of times when Jade's all over the bottom, whatever might take place. Uh, for Columbia Presbyterian Church, where I'm at at this time, we are looking at um, a Lent study. Now, Lent's not until the first Sunday in March. And we're going to be reading a book, the, the Church of Those People Who Like To, small group or whoever, from uh, Eugene Peterson called Running With the Horses. And it's a six or seven uh, passage uh, chapters on Jeremiah. And I was asked to preach the first Sunday in March of starting his office. So that's where Jeremiah comes into play. And one of the things that I've been wanting to do for this year, some of the goals, has been to be more in the Old Testament. I tend to be uh, fairly involved with the New Testament. And so, uh, reading through Isaiah, uh, right now I'm teaching a Bible study from Isaiah, where I like chapter 29, as we keep on going through the 66 chapters. Uh, Jeremiah is one of those in Ezekiel. My hope this, this year to be able to do some study on it. Uh, Jeremiah, it's chapter 1, and it's dealing with the calling of Jeremiah. And so I'd like to, at this time, good, read the scripture. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And I'm going to start at verse 4. The first three verses can share who Jeremiah is and where he's from, and I'll go over that in a moment. But here, here's God's words to us. The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. O sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. The Lord replied, Don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people. For I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some of you must uproot and tear down, destroy and ever to overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. Thus is the word of God. Let us pray. So we ask at this time, O oh God, that you might open our hearts, our minds, our ears, to humbly seek you and to listen to you, to take them in what you have to say to us. So may the words of my mouth, meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. These are tumultuous times. We might even think so as far as we're talking about Ukraine and some of the things going on in Europe at this time, the tension that's there. But at this time of Jeremiah, it's, it's very much a, a change that's very drastic for the people of Israel. Jeremiah is probably, at the time, uh, leading into the fall of Babylon, where the fall of Babylon is about 586, 587 BC. He probably has about a 40 year ministry that goes back over ways through five different kings. So he takes them all the way through to the finally. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, taking over for, taking over the, the cities of Judah, taking over for Jerusalem, and being in control. So it's a hard time. He comes from a place, Anathoth, which is north of Jerusalem, not that far, but it's in Benjamin. And as far as the tribe of Benjamin, you can have Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin, you have King Saul, it's part of that. And he's also part of Benjamin. He comes from a priestly family. His father is one that has been a, in a history of priests, and so he too has been trained as a priest. He's probably around 20 to 25 when we have this particular passage. 
And he lives into his 60s, most likely. We don't have quite where, uh, where he was and, and how he died. So at this time, he hears the word of God. And God comes from a perspective of saying, from the beginning, before you were even in the womb, I knew you. And you were wonderful. And I set you apart for a certain particular ministry to be a prophet to the nations. But from the beginning, I planned this for you. To be my prophet during this time. Now I said that Jeremiah comes from a priestly family. And I would suggest that, especially for priests, they were the ones that did the ceremony worship that took place in that community, or very close to the temple. And so he was used to that type of ministry. I also wonder, when he was told to be a prophet, that was not in his plans. Because a prophet is, thus saith the Lord, only a lot stronger language than I just said. A prophet was one who called people to live life well for God but also within your community of faith and also within society. To be a prophet, you not only say the words, you not only point out when people are out of joint in their life, you also got to live that life of what you say. And so when God says to him, you will be my prophet to the nations, his response was, no. <laughs> And he gave an excuse, this sense of inadequacy, this sense of, I don't know what he did to do with being a prophet. I mean, just the demands of being a prophet. I'm too young. Now again, he's probably around 20. It's time you could use that language for younger, but probably around 20. And if you read, you should priests especially serve as 30 years old or 50 years old. And so you say, I'm, I'm young for this, but it's that sense of inadequacy. There's actually no way I can be a prophet. I was about 18, 19 years old, and you probably heard this story from me. When um, I sensed a call past over And it would be interesting to hear uh, everyone's stories about certain things, and that would be a question I give to you. Have you ever been called? We called more than once. I just sensed that about 19, I'd been a Christian for about a year and a half. I was involved in some youth ministry uh, events and activities for a couple of summers at my home church when I come home from summer. And I just had this sense of, I, I think I'm being called the pastoral ministry. Now I had a clue what that really was. So I'd seen some people in robes up front and and, and so on. I knew youth ministry a little bit. I was just starting to learn with that. I was a, past my sophomore year in college, getting ready for my junior year. And so I announced to my family, I'm an only kid, one brat, and they just kind of looked at me when I said, I think, I think God's calling me into the ministry. I've only been a Christian about a year and a half, like I said. And for my dad, it was already hard for him that I was a Christian and taking it seriously. Kind of made me stir a little bit. Just, uh, you're just acting different. I'm not sure I'm fully comfortable here. But when I announce, I'm thinking about pastoral ministry, he just goes, in the Buck family heritage, we have never had a minister. And we're not planning on it in the future. And I started thinking about that with my dad. My goodness, the pressure that would have been on him. If I had pursued this, oh, my son's going to be a minister, and all the stories he had with his golf buddies, and his poker buddies, and all these other ones, having a son that's a pastor, I think there's some real uncomfortability with being threatened by that in his own lifestyle. But also, he saw things in me that there's just no way you could be a pastor. You've got so many areas to work on. He didn't say that, but that was another insight. And so they said no. 
And I was at a point where, you know what? I need to learn to listen and listen to God. Therefore, Lord, if you wish to go pastoral ministry, change the heart of my parents. If not, I'll pursue what I originally wanted to pursue, and that's be an educator. Both my parents were educators. That's just what I was used to doing. And so I continued down that, that road for the next couple of years. Still got involved in youth ministry at the home church. Still did many things as far as ministry in the college church I was at. And it came to about the spring of my senior year, I was getting ready to work on uh, student teaching and then head into that field. And my parents said, we think you ought to go to pastoral ministry. Mm. And I go, whoa, okay. And so that next step was to begin graduate school and to go through seminary training and, and to work from there. But calling, and we all have our different areas of how we were called to ministry. And I still continue down that road to discover what were some detailed callings and what were some other areas. But Jeremiah, he has a very unique calling that takes place. You don't find too many of these type of experiences that happen, but you do find them in the scripture. I mean, Moses, remember Moses said, I can't talk, I can't say anything, do you want me to what? And kept making excuses. He didn't want anything to do with what was going to be a very hard experience. You have Ezekiel. You have Isaiah. You got Amos. I'd say Mary would, would be one that had a special calling. Scriptures in Isaiah tell about this virgin who's going to have a child. And so you have that. You have Paul that goes through. They have these special standout type of callings that happen. And for God, God says in Jeremiah, don't say you're too young. Don't say you're inadequate. Because I am with you. I have been from the beginning. Before you were even formed in the womb. I have set you apart to do this. Just do what I say. Share what I say. And I will be with you. What a powerful, powerful experience. It's an experience that changes him. We read through Jeremiah of these difficult times that he goes through. He still stays faithful to God. His name means the Lord is exalted. Another one is the Lord throws around. And in some ways he threw around Jeremiah and various experiences if you read through those chapters. He struggled inside. He hurt inside. Because there were times he was persecuted, times he was so downgraded, he was called a liar. People set up things to try and get him because he was so threatening, because he was so pure to follow what God wanted. And you see that inner turmoil he has, but he kept going forward for the Lord. I look forward to going through all of Jeremiah to see those experiences happen. But I asked that question about call. And I gave you just an example of a calling to the pastoral ministry. But I asked that question, are we all called? Does it have to just be a clergy thing? Does it have to be a prophet? Do we have some prophets in Mill City? I would suggest the pastor before Carol myself might have a little prophet in him. It seems like prophets have people that love them, and they have people that don't like them at all. And that's a little bit of what he cared. You know, as far as the community, but did a little bit of thus say the Lord type of experience. I've seen pastors in my years here and other churches have a little bit of that prophet that's in them, a little calling. And at times gets them in trouble or alienates, but also talents that like it is on particular areas that take place. But does a calling have to be just a pastor? Are we ones that are called? I had one person in uh, Vancouver, Columbia Presbyterian, who's about 90 years old, might be 91 by now, and he finally asked the question, because I'm 90 years old. 
What can I do for the Lord? And said, so, can I take a few moments and talk to you about a person named Alice? <laughs> there were things that were called to. I would suggest we may have our seasons of focus. Carol's ministry is very much like that, a season of focus with, with, with education. And then, as a clergy person, many out there have had areas where you're dealing with people in the community for service, in your families, with your friends, and it still continues today that I would suggest there's callings and movements of God. Whether you're an educator, whatever type of work you've had, whatever kind of experiences you have, I would suggest you have various callings that take place. Some are more detailed than others. Jeremiah's are unique right out there. And one of our questions we need to ask would be, not only do each of us have a calling, are there more than that? But also ask the question, do you think God knows us even before we were in the womb? Do you think God looks on us and sees us as wonderful and wants to use you in such a way to do what he does, to love others, to give to others? to be used to draw people to God. Whatever that life is in the past, and that life is even right now. He, God touches Jeremiah on the mountain. We read that also with Coles and Isaiah. I even look at John 20, that Easter night, where you read in John, that Jesus stands in the midst of the disciples, the ten at that time. Thomas isn't there when you and that Jesus is, is dead. And he says, peace be with you. Startles them. Because remember the doors were locked. They were living in fear. And then he said, look at me. Look at my scars. And what was fearful turned into joy. He said, peace be with you. And as a father sent me, I send you. And he says this to the disciples. And that is carried from age to age, from generation to generation, to be the movement of the church in society today. I, Jesus Christ, send you. See what you're called to do. Use your gifts that God has given you. It may be gifts of office, like a prophet, or a teacher, or an evangelist. <coughs> it could be gifts of motivation as far as serving, giving, caring, encouraging, teaching, for building up the church, equipping the church, or ministering to society. For God to love the world that he gave, his only son, that whoever believed in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. God is still thinking of you as wonderful, as precious, and still living in you to be a giver to others. Amen.
mask on and taking it back off again. I'm looking forward to the end of March when we're going to have to deal with that. All right. I've had various seasons of callings. One that was a little more detailed that was to go into bivocational ministry and even had an opportunity to share that here, being athletic director and uh, taught a little bit and pastoring here too, part time. And that was a more detailed one. Uh, at this time, uh, my focus is on congregational care, especially for older ones, but for, for all ages, I'm kind of the first one of contact of the three pastors in about 600 member church. I'm part time, <laughs> kind of, you know, with that. But that's the little bit of calling. For Jeremiah, he was told to go wherever God wanted him to go. To use his words, the words he given to him, to not be afraid. Is Jeremiah going to be tearing down? But after that tearing down, you'll be building up. What's our call? I've always said, I wonder what I'm going to do when I grow up. But it will be a call, according to where God has put us at this time. God is active. God is good. And God says, peace be with you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.